Okay, serious faces. We are live. All right. Hello, everybody who is watching. So today is the first of a series of discussions about um, high performance dev teams, which is pretty cool. Now, the reason that this is a series of discussions and not just one discussion is because the topic is freaking gigantic. And so it's made up of lots of other topics, and each of those topics are big enough to have textbooks written about them. So it's quite a serious thing. So today we're going to be um, keeping it pretty high level and touching on a whole lot of different things. Um, our panel is made up of people who've got quite a vast range of experiences, so that's quite exciting. Um, and then in future discussions, we're going to be doing deep dives into specific um, pieces of this puzzle. Um, so that is the plan of action. So for those of you who are watching on YouTube, um, we are using Slido to interact with the to interact with you guys. So if you have questions you want to ask, um, please open up the Slido link and just pop it in there. You can also vote on other people's questions, um, and that's cool. So if you look at the YouTube um, video description, you'll see the link there. It's also the first message in the chat. So yeah, get on that. Um, we welcome all your questions. And then thanks to Umuzi. So I work for Umuzi, but this is separate from my building and teaching stuff that I do there. Um, but they've been supremely supportive in creating this. So they've been sponsoring me a bunch of their time. So thanks, guys. Um, yeah, that is pretty much it. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our panel. So I'm going to start off with Candice. Oh, knew it. <laughs> you are the chosen one. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Candice. I'm a people and culture manager alongside Samantha Mia. Um, I was a dev prior to this role, so I started at Intellect in 2015 as a software engineer, worked with customers like Discovery Health, Momentum Corporates, uh, both very challenging spaces, both very interesting, and throughout that journey sort of moved up from just a software engineer to an intermediate, senior, project lead, team lead. So I've got a, a wide variety of experience across the technical space, but also the, the people space. And I suppose I was just a bit more aligned with the culture part and the people part. So um, yeah, I suppose I changed my craft um, to be where I am now. Uh, fun fact about me, I've got two dogs, two dog training on the weekend. Uh, yeah, love them. I'm going to hand it over to Lucky. Yes, There's the unmute button. Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. My name is Lucky. Um, I struggle to answer what I do. I often refer, my, refer to myself as, as the Swiss Army Knife at BBD. Uh, but I effectively work in a team known as ATC. We are a research and development unit of BBD. So primarily I'm a software engineer with web as my specialty. But at the moment I teach, I run the grad program, internship programs, bursary program. We do some recruitment. I also look after a couple of teams that are building systems internally. And I also do some consulting for some of our clients. So the proof of concept type of work that comes largely with new clients. Also do quite a bit of disaster recovery or rather disaster mitigation. So when things look like they're about to go wrong, we, we, we try and step in and help where we can. And that's me, let's see, interesting fact. I play soccer and I ride horses, but I sustain more injury from playing soccer than horses. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll go with, Ken, with uh, Karina next. Thanks so much, Lucky. I like the Swiss Army knife analogy. I sometimes, uh, I feel it resonates. Um, so I'm Karina. Um, I am a multidisciplinary uh, analyst. So business analysis, process analysis, data, um, you know, sort of whatever you need. And that's what I do by trade. Um, but I poke my finger in very many pies. Um, I have done digital experience design, site reliability, engineering, uh, RTE, Scrum Master. You know, I, I go where my client needs me because when you're a contractor, you become a bit of a jack of all trades and you learn many different skills over the time. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I did not start out as a business analyst. Um, I was a real theater nerd. 
Um, I did many jobs in my life and in my 30s, a director at a company said to me, mm, you're in the wrong job. You shouldn't, you know, you this manager, mm -mm, you should be a business analyst. I'm like, oh, okay, that sounds good. And here I am 16 years later. Um, he saw something and absolutely struck uh, a passion within me for the field of analysis um, and translating business need into uh, some technical language. Um, fun fact, uh, I'm an avid gamer, uh, MMORPGs, competitive gaming. Um, uh, I started gaming out in the early 90s when we were playing on our 286s. Then we got 486s and we're like, yo, now we... And then when that Pentium 1 released, we were gods. It was great. We thought we rocked and now we laugh at our Pentium 1s. But yo, love gaming. Thank you so much. Um, Simon. Hi, I'm, I'm Simon. Spent uh, a lot of time uh, coding in Python and started PyCon South Africa. Done a lot of open source work, uh, a lot of work with like, small and uh, medium sized teams and companies. I've kind of gone through web development to kind of radio astronomy to running a data science team and most recently to uh, software for quantum devices. Um, yeah, uh, interesting facts. Uh, I, I love squash. Uh, and also a big, a ga big game, but not so much computer games, um, mostly just kind of tabletop games. And Tinas, over to you. And, and intellect. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, so I actually studied uh, engineering initially. So I, I just had a roller coaster of a career. I studied electrical engineering. I needed a bursary for my studies, so went off to this little company you may or may not have heard of them uh, called Eskom, and uh, they actually gave me a bursary. Worked there, made load shedding significantly worse. So I decided, okay, I think I'm going to start restart my career in software rather than electronics and i did and i made the jump and i joined intellect in 2015 started as a junior trying to restart my career programming learning the basics or whatever fumbled my way through made it a bit of a progression moved into the senior roles and eventually uh started leading some teams intellect worked as a team leader across a few spaces where i quickly realized the more time i spend writing code the less time other people smarter than me can uh, write better code. Uh, so change into optimizing environments and structure and creating growth journeys for people, which led me into a people-focused role in about 2020. Uh, we have been focused on this people and culture manager role with Candice, uh, essentially working with our managers and leaders uh, on ways of work, making sure people are in healthy environments, that they're growing, they have meaningful work, and um, and they're also managing the way they deal with the customers effectively, also doing some leadership development and recruiting and stuff like that. So very, very roller coaster of a journey in fairly a short space of time. Uh, interesting fact about me, so you might see from my name and my accent, I'm Afrikaans, but contrary to popular belief, I don't drive a bucky and I don't live in Pretoria. So there you go, I broke some few stigmas right there. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's my interesting fact. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, all right, so I'm just going to hit it with some questions. So I'm going to make sure that we get as broad an overview as possible, as, as much as that is possible in this amount of time. Um, so, Tinnis, I want to start off with you. Um, as somebody who's been working as a dev and working on the business side of things as well, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, gathering requirements and communicating requirements. Now, I think the reason why this is important is because, um, yeah, something I mentioned earlier, actually, like the the earlier you find a bug and fix the bug, the cheaper it is to fix. And a lot of these, um, a lot of the worst bugs actually come in during the requirements gathering phase and um, specifying what actually needs to be built. And so I think that that's, yeah, a big part of setting up a dev team for success is just that, like, onboarding people onto tasks. Um, are you happy to chat about that a little? Yeah, I definitely can talk about it. So, luckily, I've had this weird thing happen in my career, which also changed my perception, where I went from being the developer to the team lead to a product owner and the product manager for some systems where I became the customer. And 
that really changes your perspective quite a lot and you can see why we emphasize a few things um suddenly frustrated through with developers and you're like why can't they think like this uh but anyway it really emphasizes the fact that understanding the first big thing is that relationship with your customer understanding the domain so even today i had a discussion with uh, someone we're going to help externally about the company i won't call them a customer i'll call them someone who will help but essentially the same process kicks in automatically right like learn about the requirement learn about the business learn about how these things are used i think something we see especially with a lot of our junior engineers and engineering teams is jumping into solving everything with code practically solving it i mean we're practical engineers right so we want to solve all our problems but we don't always understand and you know there's a bit of a humbling aspect to well as to that side of things is you know we feel oftentimes we're the ninjas of the world we're writing code to change the world but you know the people we write software for these are practical solutions and sometimes depending on their context there's people that know more about us and spending time learning from them what their struggles are what their day to day is like away from the code solution is the first step because if you don't actually understand what their struggles are you don't understand why how the requirement came about and you can't actually challenge it effectively which sometimes requires that right like are we building the right thing or are we just building from someone's idea they think an app will solve this we sometimes you know you might need to unpack it it might be a process issue oh, yeah. and that's the essential thing so that's the initial stages now i've seen people do varying varying ways of how to go about this i've seen the big whole first week first day meet each other go for lunch day two you spend a week in a room design sprint mapping stuff out doing the requirements coming up with a high level mock up design and i've also seen the process where your startup kind of vibe it's like the customer has no clue they need they need they know they need to digitize or change strat but they don't actually know so you don't actually gather requirements you invent requirements with the customer by challenging their thinking in those in those instances um so those are some of the common ones i've seen but typically i mean a lot of people call this that you know initial we've got this phrase storming norming forming approach right because you don't just hopefully i mean unfortunately the real world the real world but in the ideal world you don't just have eight engineers engineering team goes ahead and solves problems you got a phase of spin the right people spending the right time whether that's your architects your tech leads your business analysts wherever the case may be uh to get the right context team leads in some cases to get the right context before you select who will be the best people to approach that because some solutions will be more technically focused some will be more business focused that's load Ooh. shedding um <laughs> I, it's no longer me right uh i am not working for escom anymore um our ups were kicking just now but here we are by can <laughs> that's that's awesome um so help I don't know if the other panelists have some idea or alternative perspectives. I suspect, yeah. I think Karina had her hand up first. Um, yeah, so um, I think very often what happens is um, a client um, tends to pre-solve their problem in their head and then the requirement is pre-solved and they come and say, I want this. But if you take the time to probe your client and ask strong questions, you may see that their solution is not necessarily the right thing. Um, as an example, I want you to create a screen where I can capture my customer's information. Um, okay, so why do you want this screen? And they go into how should it look there. Um, you know, diagramming, figure, but they're solving the thing for you. But if you ask the right questions, you'll find out that maybe that's not the solution. You don't need a screen. Perhaps you need uh, a, a, a text translations. Perhaps you need voice to text um, to capture it so that you don't have someone kept, you know. Um, so I think asking many questions <laughs> is important and it can avoid bugs when we come to testing. Um, also, I think often because in the old waterfall days, which had its place and still in some projects, honestly, still has a place, um, um, 
then we wrote lots of business requirements and SRDs and BRDs and TSSs. And we had lots of big sections with business rules. Now, those business rules have somewhat fallen away in the agile or user story, because in use cases, we're very detailed. User stories are a little bit simpler, but certainly makes for agile development and it's smaller chunks, granted. Um, but I think sometimes we forget to document business rules properly. And if you document your business rules up front, the propensity for bugs later on um, is just so much lower because we know that I can only capture alphanumeric values in this field, as an example. So if you plan for it up front and you have the correct test case or acceptance criteria, that really can minimize bugs uh, early on, you know, during that requirements phase. That's awesome. I agree. Yeah. Um, I like um, two things that you, I like to summarize things. It's my favorite thing. So um, I think two main points there were that um, clients sometimes have lock-in and they get tunnel vision and they're like, I want this thing, but they actually need that thing, um, which, which is a very, like, it's such a delicate thing to be like, you don't need that, you need that. Like, <laughs> like it's such a tricky conversation sometimes. And I think that's, uh, that's really cool. And some things deserve documentation. That's great as well. Um, Simon, you wanted to add something? Um, yeah, I, mean, I think I would like to start by kind of plus oneing a lot of what has just, just been said. Um, kind of getting essentially the knowledge of like of the problem space to kind of the development team is 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 really an art and but also also a science once the projects get big enough. Um, and it, it, it is very, very challenging. People have this kind of, I mean, maybe especially software developers want to put their heads down and code because they feel that that's what they paid for. Um, and uh, at the same time, the, the clients don't really know, uh, I mean, if the clients could code it themselves, then if they had a complete idea, they would really be able to code it. So, I mean, mm -hmm. The, the code is really the most detailed formal description of the system. <laughs> um, and the question is kind of how do you get, how do you get that, that right? Um, maybe something that I, I've seen happen quite often, which I think is a big mistake, is, uh, and this is mostly in kind of medium-sized organizations, you have kind of, say, like one product owner who is the bottleneck between the team and the clients um, and is therefore kind of a single point of failure. And sometimes it's a team lead, not a product owner. Um, and for small teams, one of the things I was a big fan of was, uh, first of all, having a first meeting with the client where we, we promise nothing other than that we will talk to them, essentially, um, because that kind of frees up the first meeting to be a can we do anything useful for you? Um, and the clients kind of like that because then they feel like they're getting a free meeting. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then to take the whole team along to that meeting. And like, sometimes the team feel it's a bit of a waste of their time, but I know that if it was just me at that meeting, I would somehow have to repeat all of that to the team. So they would, it would use their time anyway, and it would use my time twice. And two, any questions that they wanted to ask kind of in response or any good ideas that they wanted to maybe share with the, the client, if they shared them with me, I'd be like, I, I don't know. I didn't think to ask this question. I didn't think to suggest this idea. So yeah, so I'm a big fan of getting more people talking more directly um, well, and fantastic. remembering, yeah, I think that neither side has all of the information. Um, yeah. I think I think that's super cool. There's a whole movement um, called Shift Left. Um, it's a funny name. Who Candice wants to say something? Do you want, I, I know you finished my thing. Then, <laughs> yeah, so Shift Left is all about, um, like if you think about a, um, a chain of people responsible for different things, you usually have like, there's the client, uh, gestures are hard, and then the next person in the row is um, like the person who's requiring, who's gathering the requirements. And then after that, maybe there's some kind of designer person. And then after that, there's the developer. And it's like, okay, take the developers and put them with the designer. 
and see what happens then. Or take the designer and put them, or like as as much as possible. If you can shift people like to earlier phases, it, it tends to it tends to pay dividends. Yeah, um, yeah, and just. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to, I suppose, add on to what Karina said and maybe from a, a dev perspective. So what we speak about is the definition of that on, on user stories. So what we've seen a few times is we get a user story and all it is is a Jira heading on the story and that's basically it, right? Like create a input field for a cell phone number. And as a dev, you're like, okay, I guess I can do this, right? It's simple enough, right? It's just a cell phone number. So you, you put a field there, it allows numbers only, and then you're done. But in reality, if you think about a cell phone number, there's so many ways that you can input this thing into the field. Um, and you need to have some constraints, like should there be a plus two seven at the, the beginning to show which area? Um, can we put a bracket 011? Uh, like what's, what are those things? And um, speaking to Tina's point and relationships, if you don't have a relationship with your BA as a dev, um, you might be a bit nervous to actually raise any concerns or just, you know, reach out and try and validate what the, the user story is actually supposed to be. Um, so again, relationships are also important, but getting that definition of done on user stories is also very important, making sure that it's got the right testing criteria and right validations that we're expecting. Don't just have that hitting in on your Jira story ticket. That's good. Yeah. Um, so, of course, once we've got a couple of uh, requirements gathered and people start building, um, <laughs> software comes into play. Um, Simon made a really good comment um, before the session about how software is a kind of system and can have hor horrific consequences um, because of its inevitable failures and imperfections. Um, do you want to riff on that a little bit? <laughs> Or sorry, are you looking at me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My content. <laughs> uh, I just want to take one second to mention my somewhat crazy idea to solve the, the like bad ticket problem. Which is that okay, cool. I, I could, for, for my team, I instituted a rule that only members of the team were allowed to write tickets. Um, and then that meant that if someone wanted a ticket, they had to speak to someone in the team and have a conversation. And that was the only way to get tickets in. That's um, great. It, it worked quite well. I'm not sure if it would work everywhere, but we were a small team and it was nice. Um, oh, if you've got the right relationship with a customer, it'll definitely work. Yeah. Um, okay, so, okay, yeah, so I think we kind of know that systems go, go bad um, and it's not just software systems. And I don't know if everyone, I'm not sure, I feel like Somewhere in my software career, I started walking around the world and seeing that every system was broken. Um, and I think that, so you can do something like you call up, say the Discovery Health call center. Um, and you just like sent, I mean, this is like an important point in your life. Like you or someone in your family is like critically ill and you're just being sort of driven around the call center. And I was like, how did we end up in this kind of Kafka-esque world where some of the most important things in people's lives are essentially being like piped into dev now? <laughs> uh, and like, it's extremely tra traumatic for people. Um, and how did, how did we end up with, with systems where there was like no, no escape hatch, no ability to just go like, like hey, this, this is not working. Like, I, I just need a human who I can just go to and say, um, like, like the, the system is failing to help. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, anyway that, that's maybe I'll <laughs> I've seen lots of nodding. Um, yeah. And I guess the, the question, I think one of the challenges for software development is, and maybe other system building is, how, how do we make things better? So that we're not like our systems are not occasionally just like steamrolling people, like, like when their mom has cancer or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a freaking hard question. <laughs> so um, what I do day to day is I, well, I, I work for a Muzi and what we do is we, we train people into um, high value careers for the most part. Um, and my role there is to build software and kind of 
people systems around that software that takes noobs and turns those noobs into professionals. And it's like, it's so hard to stay human centered um, when doing this, because if you want to scale up and be efficient about things, then sometimes people get lost in the noise and they like, like they are the forgotten children, <laughs> you know? Um, so we gotta, like, it's, it's very, very hard to keep that balance and to make sure that like, you know, if the metrics say that somebody's badly behaving, like may, maybe they just have a problem at home. How do we, how do we check? So yeah, I'm all, all for escape patches. It's just like, yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard problem. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Lucky? Yeah, um, I think to, to, to Simon's point, um, one of the, the first people to teach me software development said something to me that has stuck till, till this day. And his point was, you have no right to touch the keyboard until you solve the problem. I think a lot of us, especially as developers and engineers, we're very quick to build out systems. And I've been guilty of this myself. Um, during COVID, we were working with some charity organization and I was very quick to spin up an application and I went and built it myself. And then I fell sick, so there was no one there to maintain it. Whereas the problem could have been solved by putting together a bunch of open free tools that someone else could have managed. And that taught me a very, very important lesson that when you are engaging with a client, what they're looking for is not your piece of code. What they're looking for is a solution to the problem that they have. The problem what I found uh, with, with, with the specialized consulting is that often the problem is usually processes and the systems that they already have. And sometimes when you introduce just another system, you're actually just compounding the problem. So I think yeah. directly in line with this requirement gathering thought, it's important to understand that you're not gathering requirements just for the software that you're building, but you're actually gathering requirements for the solution that you're delivering to the client that you're building. So if we're looking to, I don't know, help kids cross the road, maybe an app to keep track of all of the kids isn't the problem. Maybe we just need to have someone there to stop cars and help the kids cross the road. And as soon as you start looking or considering yourself as a partner to help your clients solve their problems, the more faith and confident your clients will have you so that they can come to you for further advice. Maybe that one time they didn't need software and therefore they don't need your solutions uh, as long as you would have liked, but trust me, the next time that they encounter a similar problem, you'll be the first person that they come to. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. I want to tie in because I love what Lucky's saying and I mm -hmm. agree with you. And I like, Lucky, one thing that's coming to my mind as you're speaking is something. Um, do you guys also have a sound, or does it mean? That's a, it's a weird buzzing sound. My laptop is yeah. it's learned a new trick. Oh, uh, that was happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, 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 I thought that's a grinder. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that's better. Sorry about that. So, <laughs> okay, um, Lucky, the one thing that strikes me, and it's something I really like what you're saying, and I think it's something I've seen and I've been guilty of as well, especially when I was diving, is is like there is value in having empathy for the person that will use your system and having empathy for the customer finding themselves in the situation they find themselves in when they come to you with the problem because the quick thing to do in that situation is like oh well, this is terrible this is a bad idea we can do this significantly better but not understanding why things came to that point and then trying to just solve everything with the system to your point leads us to this point where we're building stuff and we're actually making people hate technology rather than love it right like we shouldn't be in the situation where people in their 40s or 50s are like oh, i just don't want to see another app and whatever the case and, and and a silly example that we all experience from a dev perspective is the curse that microsoft put on us with the, the terrible error screens that they had in the 90s and 95 and 98 because 
all users of Microsoft learned, oh, error pops up, close it. And now we're trying to put valuable, useful instructions to those error messages, and they see error, retry, because that's what you used to do with 95 and 98. But I think having that step back and thinking that let's put ourselves in the people's shoes, to your point about maybe we just need someone there that guides the people of the street, what is the real world application? Now, sometimes I found that some teams are in a position where they can actually use the system that they build, which is always to my benefit, and I'm a strong believer if you can, you should. Um, but that's not always possible, right? If you're building it for, you know, some of us shouldn't have access to types of data for some types of customers for obvious reasons. So we just build the system. But what I found value in that, which was something that kind of picked up a little bit pre-COVID and kind of faded away is, and for various reasons, is people going and watching people use these tools that they built. Seeing them frustrated, hit their head, want to punch the keyboard and the mouse, because then you, for the, you're like, I didn't think that that's how they would interpret my system. But having that knowledge is invaluable to improving the tools. I mean, we all became engineers because we're problem solvers and we want to solve problems in the real world. And we might think we're doing it, but we're not. So your requirements might have been right. You've gotten the right feedback. You built what the customer asked for, but your end user is having a terrible experience and you're not getting that insight. And luckily, you know, we've got metric tools that we can put app insights on, on Microsoft, for example, these kind of things that gives us some indication of how people use things and the heat mapping on systems, but they still value in actually seeing someone's frustration in front of a, a computer. Simon had that exact example. Uh, I have a crisis, I'm being transferred here. Yeah, Simon, to your point, you reminded me last week, when the vertical network died, um, there was a third of the country like we got cut up for a while and I was like trying to get an Uber and I called the call center and it was like, if you're inquiring about top up services, press one. If you'd like to take out a new contract, press two. And it's like number nine was like, if you're suffering network outages, you know, and then you have this little call before we pursue you, please turn off your phone and turn it on. I'm like, I've done all of this stuff. I'm stuck on the street and I'm trying to get an Uber. Help me out here. Someone directly. And then I got transferred to the auto bot that we are here to interpret my voice message. And then like, was I helpful at the end? And I just said, no, you were not helpful. Get me a person to help me, please. And that's, that's what I think luck is doing. It's like, we shouldn't be naive in the sense that we can solve everything programmatically. Sometimes if we walk away from a customer saying, I don't think code will solve your problem but I think we can improve your process is worth more than us building a system that then sends people down the wrong track for the sake of building it. And, and then maybe that is something to try and match requirement whereas Karina, I'd love to get your take on this. Pushing that in conversation up front somehow to the requirement phase, you know, that would be useful. So the, um, the company I'm currently contracted with, uh, being IQ Business, has a quite a nice large department called Experience Innovation, which really is about experience design. And this is not an ad for IQ. Uh, they're not sponsoring me, um, but 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 they have taken a great um, focus on UX. Okay, because you are yes, you are. UX, the experience of the user. Okay, so we've got a whole team and my last project happened to be around experience design. So to all these points with Lucky and Tinnis, um, it is so integral. And I wanna give a little story about how Investec does this right. I'm involved with Investec via OfferZen. Um, we do programmable banking uh, uh, with the Investec group. They give us access to their back end, their, all their APIs. We can write programs, program our cards, etc. Great fun. But because I'm involved in that community, they approached me to help them with their sort of beta testing. So when they are rolling something out on their digital platform, they phone a human being that is not in their organization and they talk you through this so they 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 bring it up it's like in a figma or something and you play around with it and they give you an instruction they say um can you uh, uh, apply for for a uh, life insurance and then you on the screen click where you need to and they, they go, why did you click there 
tell you, mm, a little bit uh, Freudian. They get a little bit of psychology. Why did you? And I'm like, why didn't I? Because it's at the top and it's, a, it's you know, it's the uh, a bar that makes sense. Oh, no, but we didn't want you to click there. We wanted you to yeah. click here somewhere else. I'm like, it doesn't make sense to me. So, so whether it made sense or not in, in that use case, the point is if you speak to end users, whilst designing and writing your requirements you're obviously going to do that during testing i hope many people do that if it's not a sensitive type of project but then you can early on see where the user's mind goes you know what is their experience of that system before you even have written one line of code or even got architecture in place um so i think they do that very well and i think there's extreme value in considering that user experience Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, I think uh, user experience is golden. Um, probably, I don't know, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of devs knowing about user experience and leveling up around that. I think it's a damn fine idea. Uh, it's, yeah. Um, so, um, in, in favor of turning this into a, a broad overview um, of, of all things uh, high performance tech um, dev team, let's move on to a couple more technical things. So. Um, there are a few questions coming in. I think I'll, I'll hold those questions for a little while. Um, Lucky, I've got a question for you. So just your job is really like really interesting because you work in effectively a R&D department and a training department. And so for me personally, when I'm learning a new tool, um, like let's say I'm learning a new framework or something and I need to build something with it, I'll build, um, but I'll discover like, good ways of building afterwards. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll build a thing, I'll be like, oh, I could have totally done that better. And there's often not a lot of time to circle back and fix it um, immediately. Um, and if I'm building on a team of people and they're all discovering these practices together, then it's pretty chaotic. Um, and I know that you also spend a, like, you, you work in education as well. Um, so how do you, how do you wrangle, like, that, that kind of knowledge, like um, knowledge of tools, knowledge of best practices around tools, making sure that like the devs sort of, um, like you don't want to force people to do everything in exactly the same way. Um, the consistency is really useful as well. So do you have any like any tips or practices around that sort of thing? Yeah, and, and this is going to come from a purely personal and experience perspective. So I, I there's a couple of things that values that I hold about software that guide this. Um, firstly, the most, I think, prominent for me is that software and all of these languages and tools and frameworks, all they are are means to an end. So especially as a, as a web developer, we end up getting into large debates about which framework is the best and which one is better, and people will get tattoos about which one they, they, they've signed their allegiance to. I don't subscribe to that notion. For me, software tools and all of these things are, are, are just a means to an end. The second thing is that I've worked in very large and very old enterprise banking systems quite a lot. And I've also been privileged enough to see new projects start up, move very quickly, have people change. And so one of the things that I've seen is straight to Simon's point about how all systems end up being really, really, really crap. So what we end up doing at the end is that we try to make them suck just a little bit less. So I find that a lot of people get very attached to the decisions that they make early on. And we need to understand that when we make decisions, we make them within a specific context, with a specific understanding. And we need to be mature enough to understand that our understanding of the context changes, the context itself changes, and the ecosystem that we operate changes so fast that it is impossible for you to make the perfect technical choice today that will still be perfect even in two years. So I think when you tackle all of these decisions and these type of things from that lens and you communicate those things to your team, your team firstly becomes less anxious about making the wrong decision. They understand what the goal is, which is to deliver value to your clients, value to the people that use your systems. And with those things as the goal, you will never really find yourself saying, I made the wrong call at the beginning. Because your whole team 
will be much more open to the idea of continuously assessing if the tools you have serve you, and they'll always be open to the idea of pivoting. And the last and most important thing, I think, is that those channels for communicating and have, and coming up with new approaches and suggestions, they need to stay open. I found that um, I've worked with, with, with super experienced, super smart engineers that have been building things for 20 odd years. And they're sometimes a bit more hesitant to move towards newer technologies. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, you get a lot of new developers that want to use the latest and shiniest tool that actually hasn't been battle tested. So I think any leader in a in a in the industry that we're in, you need to be able to find the balance between those and get the entire team really discussing about why do you think this is good, why is it not. So I think if you take that approach, keep the communication channels open and understand that all the decisions that you're making, you're only making them with what you have in front of your eyes now and be open to change. For me, that's how I approach all of these things. Yes, I'm. Uh, yeah, so I, th I think one of the things that, like, that I observed is that the point at which a team knows kind of more about a problem than, than they kind of sort of ever did before is when they kind of meet that first deadline of like we have a working solution. And so from a kind of creating amazing solutions point of view, that's the point where now that the team know the most about the technologies and about the problem, where they should have time to improve <laughs> things if you want it to be awesome. Um, and a lot of companies, I think, are very reluctant to embrace this idea, even though it makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, but it is great. I found it's great if you can do it. Um, I, I did unfortunately find that the only way to do it was essentially just to lie to management. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To kind of hit that point like er earlier so that you had, yeah, that you that you had time to kind of re revisit um, and weren't sort of immediately yanked across onto a new project. Yeah. Um, I just, I just want to say, Simon, you realise this is recorded and going out live. Okay. Right? Yeah. Just, just say. <laughs> yeah. So from uh, my side, um, I, I want to say the word that techie people hate, and that's documentation. Um, so something that's worked well for us in the past is ADRs. Um, I think it's architectural decision records. Mm. So when we're working on a, a long running project that is already as old as you, uh, like 20 years old, um, having a, a documentation in the readme that is readily available and talks through what decisions were considered, what were the pros and cons, why was this decision made at the time that it was made. Mm. And as a new developer coming into the team initially like, oh, what the hell, why did they choose this? Um, you can go to the README and read through that decision-making process and be like, okay, this, this actually makes sense. They did weigh up the pros and cons here, and this is actually the best fit tool to solve the problem right now. Um, so I think that's it's a nice sort of living document to create um, and to make future developers hate you a little bit less, um, but just to help them also understand the thinking around why you use that tool for the solution at the time. Um, yeah, I'm a fan of those. I think even with developing like human processes where you get like, you know, people interacting in a certain way in a larger system, like it's useful to write down why you made certain decisions and the experiments you tried and how they didn't work and how they did work really well. Uh, that's that's fantastic. I'm such a fan. It, um, it would be so, so great to have a fiction writer on staff and whenever someone like left a project or the company the fiction writer would like interview them for the sort of life story of the project and add it into this like great gripping novel that everyone read. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, maybe we could do something with ChatGPT. <laughs> gotta, gotta drop that in somewhere. <laughs> Cheers now. Um, that's all awesome. Um, one thing that I wonder about, however, is like, 
with a lot of freedom. Um, like you either need to trust the devs quite a lot, or you do you do still need some kind of um, system of quality control. Um, I think I think it was you, Karina, who put in a comment in our um, own Slido about um, cowboy implementations. And I've seen cowboy implementations, and I've picked up the pieces afterwards myself. Um, so how do we? How do we allow that freedom? Because that freedom is like freaking, it's a powerful, powerful thing, but also maintain quality and robustness. Um, I, does anybody I think, want to, yeah. Yes, I, I don't think there's a perfect answer. I think that uh, will be solved, dif solved differently by different teams. Generally speaking, and we're talking here about high performance dev teams, so we're assuming experience and that these people are experts because, and, and I made some notes, if it's okay, if I just, yeah, just yeah. you know, to structure my thoughts. The, the question is what, what is a high performing dev team? Okay, mm -hmm. it's a bunch of people that can work independently and don't need policing. They can take initiative. They can work with less instruction from the client, perhaps. Um, they are true problem solvers um, and innovative. And by innovative, I don't mean they're bringing a new thing to the market. I mean, they can be innovative about how they solve problems, right? Because that's what makes, that's what makes you worth your gold. It's if you can solve a problem, uh, like Lucky said, and it's the true problem. That the client has that's what what you're there for and then um multi-skill so there's a range of skill sets right um and in an experienced dev team uh we have collaboration and communication um so we communicate uh, among each other we solve problems but i think every team will probably deal with a cowboy problem differently. Because also, I know I'm an experienced dev. I, I know I'm going to kick some ass. I know I can write this code. But if we put a process, a safety process in place, like a little safety net, and we have that four eyes rule, where uh, Lucky's writing some code and just before he's feeling cowboy and we know he, he's a good cowboy he looks hot in that boots and that hat is for him however just to make sure Lucky's gonna go to Sheena and say Sheena can you just just check this quickly and I honestly think it's the simplest way to solve that it's when people get a slight god complex or they believe they're that these are not team players and collaborators. And coming back to what is a, 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 a high functioning or high performing dev team, it's people that can collaborate. It's people that can do teamwork. It's people that can take, I don't even want to call it criticism. I like peer review. We are reviewing for each other. I don't care, Sheena, if you're a more junior dev and Lucky is a more senior. We look at each other's stuff. Because if you think of writing up a document, and this is something I've learned just uh, in terms of documenting lots of stuff, word, spell check, grammar check is not going to pick up the difference between there and there. Because they're both spelled correctly. And it's the same, I think, in code. Uh, you can just forget that you commented something out. But, but lucky forgot, Sheena will catch it. And if you just take a moment to ask someone to have a look at it before you go cowboy, I think it can solve a lot of problems. That makes a lot of sense. I think many eyes make for fewer bugs. That's a big deal. And it also makes for a better bus factor. Um, yeah, Tinas? I think Simon had his hand up before me. So oh, I'm going to okay. give to Simon. Okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, also when we were when we were when I was thinking about the, the kind of high performance dev teams before, I kind of went I think on a similar kind of thought train to Karina, which was actually speaking about high performance dev teams is kind of strange, right? It makes, it makes it sound like a motor car, and we don't really talk about I don't know like high performance musicians or high performance like carpenters. Um, I mean may, maybe we should, but. Um, so I was kind of like wondering what 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 do we really mean? And I, I like um, I like this kind of idea of sort of solving the the right problem. Um, but I also like the idea of being a good craftsman and probably the thing I kind of look for for the most. So 
I'm completely fine with sort of there being kind of the cowboy coder on the team who's kind of breaking ground for the team, say. Um, but I'm not that interested in working for people who don't care about the craftsmanship. Um, kind of, I, the people I know who I think of as really great developers, when it's 11 p.m. at night and like the server is down, their code is still great. Um, because that's just the level they kind of hold themselves to. So kind of everything they produce is, is like that. And if you don't kind of hold yourself to that level, then your code tends to not be that great because you're not practicing kind of at that level. There's a saying that you uh, kind of, you don't rise to the level, like in a crisis, you don't rise to the level of your aspirations, you descend to the level of your practice. So I like people who are just always kind of writing nice code. Um, and then I think Dijkstra sort of said this like very much at, like <laughs> when computer science was being founded, the job of like a software engineer is, or a computer scientist, is not to write code, it's to write code and a proof that the code is correct. Um, and so I think the, the bad cowboy case is when they produce code which kind of is not correct and they haven't even attempted to prove it. And you kind of can't have a senior developer, kind of as Karina said, who isn't interested in solving the whole problem. Um, you kind of got to want to do that. You, you can solve like a chunk of the problem by getting someone else to do it, by like buying them cake, that's going to, whatever works, it's going to be fine. But you've got to be able to see that it wasn't solved and see that that's a problem. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think my feedback will tie nicely to what you. So, Karina, you said not criticism. I think about it differently. And now we're talking about high developing high performing dev teams, not high performing devs, right? So let's talk about the teams concept because it's part of what we're talking about. So the one thing you said I don't think is criticism. I think feedback, but developing a culture of feedback within a dev team is a healthy thing. And it's something that should be established up front. So, Simon, you said, you know, we, we need to be careful not to say we only want to work with the best developers because these developers are going to retire one day and we need to start growing the next batch of great developers. And the only way we're going to do that is by involving our juniors, even you said that crisis at 11 p.m., get that guy who's two years into his career in that call, even if he can't contribute, because he needs to see how in the senior experienced people think. That's how we transfer knowledge. Now, how do you encourage that culture of feedback? Because it's easy to say our seniors will review the code of our juniors. But what happens to our senior craftsmen, right? To become better craftsmen if they're technically inclined, if they're people inclined, whatever the case may be. And I found that the f culture of feedback, if you get that right, goes both ways. So a junior needs to be taught why we must have two PRs approved before we release. And then suddenly the seniors decide, no, we're going to go, you know, this is a hot fix, we're going to go. The junior needs to be encouraged and pushed by the team to question why are we not following the process I was taught and the seniors can justify their answers through their experience if they can't justify their answers for a decision or way of implementation that means they haven't actually thought through the problem properly and the junior will learn why sometimes you don't just life isn't a tick box and you just go through the tick boxes why certain decisions are made at some point in time because the senior is giving him that feedback so that's building and establishing that collaboration effect because if you want the team to be performant you can't have your sql expert write all the sql because the moment that person resigns or retires you're screwed where if that senior has been spending time with your intermediates and your juniors teaching them their craft and giving them their feedback and actually over time trust building a trust relationship to give them the work and then reviewing that work it's like you up, uplift the general tide and quality across the board, right? So I think we're touching on something which I am very passionate about, and that, that culture of feedback and accountability within the team. And if you set the boundaries for what the feedback should look like and what your standards are, Simon, to your point, mm -hmm. if you set that, then you can hold each other accountable in a fair manner to say, but that's not the standard that this team operates in, or this is the standard we like to operate in, and this is why. 
So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I am a big fan. Mm-hmm. And yes, Kareem, it's not criticism. Criticism means you're delivering the message wrong, but there's a time for criticism. But in general, the culture should be feedback, engaging. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I like that. So, <laughs> excuse me. I find it slightly strange that people um, have a tough time having their work criticized. And I was having this conversation with my supervisor and she pointed, well, by supervisor, I mean supervisor at university where I'm, where I'm studying. And she pointed out something very interesting. So I studied um, a mixture of uh, art and engineering. So I studied game design and with electrical engineering. And she pointed out something that I hadn't realized in that <clears throat> in the art um, faculty, the idea of critique is embedded in every single thing that they do. So if you're going to perform, how you get marks that you perform, you put on your show and people will critique you. And that critique is seen as everyone helping you get better. Whereas in the engineering discipline, how we get assessed is, does your circuit work? It doesn't work, you have failed. Does this do this specific thing? It doesn't work, you have failed. You, you are going to kill people, you are a bad engineer. And I walked into this industry holding both of those things, but the game design part of it um, so, sort of took a bigger hold uh, of me because even when I produced games, even when I was writing code, the people that gave me that critique would always point out what was wrong, but would also be able to help me on how to fix it rather than this is broken. And how we were able to do that is even before you get to the deadline, have those feedback loops much, much sooner in it. And the language that we use as well matters. Instead of just shutting people down and saying, this is broken, right? This is an opportunity for you to improve this. Oh, here's an article that will explain how this can be done better. So even the language that you use becomes very, very important. I think that's great. Um, something I like to say uh, is feedback is a gift. And so you need to re- remember that when you're giving somebody feedback and also when you're receiving it. Like if some cantankerous old dev says, this is broken, say, thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> now I get to fix it. <laughs> um, like, yeah, people people can get angry at text sometimes, but I, th- I think that's a big deal. Just, yeah, I-, I think Simon had something to add there. Sure. Uh, I found the single most effective technique for kind of getting good feedback cycles going is to encourage kind of criticism of kind of yourself as a more senior person. So like if I have a new dev, I always try, like the first thing is not to review their pull request, but to get them to review mine. And yeah, and then usually they're like worried that they don't have anything to say. And I'm like, your job is to like, basically not approve this until you understand what it does. So just keep asking questions. Um, and, And usually then there'll be a whole discussion and and then they'll be more relaxed. Um, and, and these days I go a little bit further, which is I also try and push like my work up for review much earlier. Um, so I kind of I will push something up when I'm still kind of cleaning it up and polishing it, because then there will be things for people to look at. And also I will get earlier feedback. And quite often people are like, oh, what about this? And I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. Um, So it's a great way to onboard new people onto a team because it's <laughs> that's often very very tricky if you onboard them on the, by saying like I did this this way now this is my latest greatest thinking about how to solve these kinds of problems with these kinds of tools then that knowledge is in their heads that's fantastic um, I think that a lot of what we're saying here is technical but it's also very much related to how the culture of the dev team works and um, we have a couple of uh, I think we've all experienced culture. Um, I think my favorite culture um, uh, quote, I don't know who originally said it, is um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And that's probably right. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, Candice, do you want to talk a little bit more about what a healthy dev team culture might look like? I know it's a big, big topic, but like the um, like top three takeaways or <laughs> in no particular order. <laughs> 
Uh, so I think Karina touched on it quite a bit there as well when she started on her topic. Um, I think I agree with her in terms of being autonomous. So people that are able to pick up tasks when they're available rather than being told they need to pick up a task, being able to run with the task themselves. Um, I think it, it's still important to ask for help, right? So like, don't just be completely isolated. Uh, we talk about the 45 minute rule. So, you know, if you get stuck for 45 minutes, don't be afraid to reach out for help and ask for some guidance as well. Um, but yeah, so that autonomy, I think collaboration is very important. So um, Simon, you touched on it in the fact that you don't wait for your code to be perfect, but you provide, you push it up to get feedback um, as quick as possible. So I think being pragmatic, um, so don't wait for that perfectionist stage, but rather try and collaborate with your team members as soon as possible, because at the end of the day, you're going to be providing a better solution if you get everyone's feedback in as soon as possible. Um, and then I suppose just growing each other, I think would be the third one. So I think for me, autonomous teams, being pragmatic and just collaborating with each other to get the best solution. Um, what did I say, third one? Growth. <laughs> right. So um, I suppose not in terms of own development, but growing the project. Um, are you can you find innovative ways to improve the solution itself? But are you also looking internally and growing yourself as well? So I suppose those are my three points that I think is important for a high performing dev team. Yeah, it's a massive topic to go on for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's also, I, I found it's also not even just about the team, but also about the situation they're in, and also even the domain that they're working in. Like sometimes the team um, might be kind of, kind of really like super high performing, working on one project in one area. Um, but if you sort of switch domains, um, kind of, so they might perform kind of less well. Um, and sometimes I think you also just, you have to just iterate to kind of find the sweet spot with like the problem you're solving, the people you have, how you, how you're working. Yeah, I think, I think you're right, Simon. And to the environment point, there's some interesting studies been done. And I think it came from military initially where, um, people would, or was it something, drug addicts, some people that were, I think, Second World War, that were struggling with drug addiction, and they got called up to the military, and the moment they were in a structured environment uh, with a routine, they actually, it, there was a higher success rate in people becoming cured of their addiction than when they were back in a previous environment. And that kind of talks to your point. It's like, you take the same group of people, you put them in different environments, you get different outputs. Um, and the environment may, is important, but I think, and you know, there's a part of the culture discussion which is not the fluffy, nice, happy, clappy stuff. That is also part of an effective culture which one needs to talk about. And you know, the, an effective team trait. So if you, if I look at what I look at a team and thinking, why would there be an effective dev team? One of the things it would look like is how do they respond when the variables change? When because there's a certain amount of things that you have an area of control over as engineers uh, and as developers, and there's stuff that will be outside of your control, which you know we're okay to acknowledge when it comes to constraints in uh, the mathematical sense or with the programming sense, but it's something we look to resist the moment it's a human element. So you know, customers saying that we will only use these technologies, there's a lot of resistance towards that, rather than saying, well, this is our constraints, let's be creative in our uh, approach to solving this problem, given what we need to work with. So, I mean, that's also, it's the less nice part of the culture, but it's still an effective one. And there's a thing, right? Like you can see it. I see many teams. It's like five guys, server, your example, server goes down 11 p.m. at night or the app crashes, right? You find out about it next morning, you hear 
all six guys jumped on a call because there was a WhatsApp group and they actively watched that group. They didn't ignore it. They were on there. And when morning come, the system was operational. They were not told, they were not expectations. They're not told to work outside of office mm -hmm. hours, but they jumped in and did it. And then you have a team where one guy jumps on, the most senior guy, and he's the guy always fixing the issues. And the rest of people don't see the comms, but the next morning, oh, that I didn't know nine o'clock kind of afternoon. Like it speaks to the culture within that team, right? Like there's trust between people. When, when the tough times come, the group either comes together or they don't. So effective team rather than effective individuals within that space. And it, it's weird how the, these things, there's no tangible way to measure it. You kind of, you know, look at it in the results and the results not being the thing was delivered on time. Uh, it's more in terms of like how people respond to get to an outcome. Um, that's more what, what I would look at when I evaluate culture. Yes. Yeah. That leads me to a, a few other questions. I think one thing that's really interesting is like how coming up with the definition of what, what is a high performance dev team, like that's hard. Um, and the high performance dev team has a, a high performance culture that's got a like a good developer experience that encourages the right kind of behavior um, and also, you know, um, encourages sustainable behavior as well. Um, is Are there ways to measure, like, good performance in a dev team? Like, if you were to build a dashboard and say, like, here is what we're going to measure, is there such a thing? Or is it, um, or is that, does that seem like an impossible thing? Because a, a, it's such a tricky thing to measure productivity in in dev land because every every puzzle that we solve is a little different and yeah um do you guys have thoughts on that yeah. <laughs> <Is> anybody <laughs> yeah a lot i'll go with, with, with yes it's impossible in general <laughs> um, I mean, it's okay. very easy to get sort of into various sort of metrics which equates to Kind of moving fast or being high efforts or being engaged um but there, there are some kind of really i mean there are there are some like teams who produced just really beautiful sort of like kind of pieces of software um and yeah they, they were kind of more like sort of i don't know like woodworkers they would like like they would think for like a few days and then they would write the right, like the right solution. Um, and I don't know how you would measure that because sometimes someone thinks for days and it's not doing anything. <laughs> um, and sometimes someone thinks for days and it's much better than like having a team of like five people work for six months coding all the time. And, and I don't know how to tell like <laughs> which of these is, is better in any particular situation. Yeah. So I think I've experimented with this, actually, with teams measuring it. So I think something where we get the perception of measurement wrong is we look at outside constraints coming in. So a predefined set of metrics. Now, there I agree with you, Simon. Coming up with a predefined set of metrics to evaluate someone is, is wrong. However, I have never gone to a team that I can clearly see is suffering or dysfunctional, asked them how you guys are doing, and they told me, excellent because people actually know we are not performing as a team. So everyone knows when the culture is strong and everyone knows when the culture is not strong. So clearly there's a metric because otherwise they wouldn't be able to give you an answer. Now, there's this interesting thing I've experimented with with a few teams and it's been fairly successful. So now Candice is probably tired of my message, but I've had good success with this. Spotify trialed this because they had the squad of squads thing, right? And Spotify actually experimented with this tool called a health check team health check and we've implemented with a few teams and people track themselves this and it's basically got a whole bunch of metrics but instead, instead of making them tangible stuff they're broad so for example a category and you it's all rag statuses right red amber green or no vote and they essentially mean client relations that's literally all it says client relations and amber has no definition Green has, we have great relations with our customer. Our customers loves us and they trust us. And red means our customer hates us. They think our shit, we're not delivering anything. Like that's the extremities of the categories definitions. And the team has to put themselves in one of those three anonymously. So no one sees what the other person's vote. So there's no influence of vote. And they put this in. 
And you go through this, then there's support, there's teamwork, there's quality of code, there's uh, all these things we place, release pipeline, speed of delivery, all these things that we actually know, they have defined, experimented with, we've changed a few, added a few of our own, but the teams get to vote. And then the value is not actually in the score. The value is in the discussion the teams has about those things because suddenly people realize, I didn't know Sheena was not enjoying the way in which we do our PRs. I thought it's great. Now that awareness is with me, so I can track this. Now, if you do that score, you get like an average across the team. You do that every second month. You can track, actively track and see the team improving or going down based on things that happen. So it's not giving people a checklist of things to do, it's giving people a heat map of focus areas within your team that are not strong, which you might need to start addressing. Also recognizing the areas that you are strong in. So if the team's quality of code is good, now, this is a cool thing. One thing cool about the health check, sorry, side check. No team has ever given quality of code green. I have not encountered one team that thinks their code is the best there ever is, which is fascinating. Um, that typically always, if a team is happy, it ends in the amber column, um, but that's a funny story. But the thing is they can actually track these things and then come up with nice things. So it's not specifically tracking the culture, but it's tracking the team's sentiment of how the culture is doing across a lot of the things that we know make effective dev teams. Um, so what you're describing, I think of as, as insight metrics. Um, and a lot of what we do in coding and system design is work on invisible, intangible things. Um, like no one can see the code running. And therefore, anything which brings visibility is usually super useful. Um, the, the trick, though, is that there's this kind of maxim that if you use a metric if you control it, and this is actually from engineering, so lucky you should know this. If you if you use if you control the metric, it it stops providing you any insights. Um, so as soon as you kind of put pressure on a metric to go in some direction, that kind of no longer no longer give, gives you insight. So that's the kind of the danger and the, the tension here. But yeah, but in, insight metrics are great for just helping either a team see what's going on in this like invisible interpersonal space or what's going on in their invisible software, like what's happening on the server, like, yeah. yeah. Uh, my, my thoughts on the, on the topic are that these type of things um, that, that were often described as soft matters uh, need a multi-pronged approach. There's, there's no one thing that is going to give you um, a, a hope holistic view. I absolutely love the, the idea of generating those heat maps. I think it would be really useful if they're complemented. So the first thing like reviews, right? The mere fact that I'm being told that I should do a review for someone right now already uh, messes up with my psyche. Uh, if the person uh, made me upset in the last week or if I had a really bad day today, the, those scores are going to be very different compared to what it would have been if I took a nap, right? So yeah, all of those yeah. things are, 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 are factors that are going to impact this. One of the things that could be particularly useful to look at, well, I, 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 I consider it disaster mitigation, is to focus on those outliers. So, and how you do that is by letting people volunteer to provide that feedback. Because what you want to do is wherever there's a, sort of like a good cult or a, a good momentum. You want to encourage that and help that grow. But if anything falls out, like someone is, is, is ecstatic, marks their code as green, you want to be able to catch that and celebrate it and, and, and make a big deal of it. So I think taking what uh, 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 you've said and perhaps adding a, a voluntary component to it, if I really feel like, you know what, I've worked with this person, they're absolutely great. I want to give them a, a, a green in this range of things. Or today has been a really bad day because this thing happened. I want to give it a, a, a red. I think once you start combining a bunch of different approaches, you start seeing a, a much more realistic view. Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add is like, yeah, I agree. If you're going to give the criticism when things go wrong, it's also important 
sell appointment thing so on. Because I mean, our job is not an easy one, and if I'm talking about invisible things, it's not always a celebrated one. But oftentimes there is something to celebrate, even if it's as simple as like our API latency has gone down by fifty percent. No one sees this, but for us, we are happy. This improvement has made a difference. So I agree with you, Lucky. It's important. All right. So, not a lot of questions are coming in. Wait, we've got one. Um, okay, this is good. Um, to what extent does the panel see the dev team responsible for support? Um, so, so if something goes wrong late at night, um, is that kind of troubleshooting something that sits on the heads of the development team, or is that supposed to sit on somebody else's head? Um, I, I have a strong opinion here. Um, I also <laughs> as a strong as well. yeah. um, I guess I think, um, I, I, I still consider myself a, a, a developer primarily all of these other hats that that are crouching onto my time I see them as extra things even though I don't write much code lately but personally as a developer when I ship something it is I see it as me putting part of myself out there. It is, it is my craft. It is these years that I've been on this thing and putting it out there. And if something goes wrong and what I put out there isn't what I expect it to be or of the quality that I wanted it to be, I will be the first person to jump up and say, I will fix it because it is not a representation of who I am. That's how I view these things personally. So I think it's important. But to to answer the question holistically, especially from a team culture perspective, the way that I operate teams is that we're all in this together. It is absolutely everyone's responsibility. So last week, I, I, I gave a talk about accessibility. And the big question was, whose responsibility is it to make sure that the systems we, we, we put out there uh, are, are accessible? And the answer is absolutely every single person. So when the system is down, there are people that need to man the line, there are people that need to manage the relationships, there are people that need to dig into code, people that need to make sure that once the code is fixed, it's been deployed. So I think it's the entire team's responsibility to make sure that we are fixing the solution for our clients and the people that use our system. That's my view. Yeah, I think the one thing I would add to Lucky, and I, I echo, so I won't say a lot, but it's the word ownership, right? Um, I mean, when you're going to take on a task, whatever that is, technical, personal, gym, first, you know, whatever it is, you know, do you take ownership of what you put in and what you then put out? And, you know, if, if, if you don't own the task from the day that you take it, then it's essentially never yours. So then whatever code you wrote in there, you probably implement someone else's thing. And, and it, it's uh, now we're talking on a psychological level about how you approach things, right? But it, yeah, I agree with Lucky. When I put out code and that shit goes down, I'm, I will, I've set for, I've set longest session I've ever had was a big issue. I won't say it's completely my fault, but it was a 36 hour straight piece of like writing code and fixing and getting the company back up and running. That's, it was because like it wasn't my code that broke it but i'm now the developer working on this and i want i've owned the problem and therefore it's mine to solve and if i don't address this then you know like it's to lucky's point like the image that what i'm putting out about myself isn't valid i mean we don't always have the luxury of working on the most beautiful system not everyone's going to build the next facebook or whatever it is that's fancy these days right but whatever it is it's like it still has your name, right? There's some PR with your name on it somewhere, or, you know. So, yeah, I'll give it to Simon. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what's been said, but I also want to push back a bit because I think the broader context is quite important. So, I mean, if you have a million users and it was built by like a team of like three devs, um, it's easy for kind of the responsibility to crush those three people. <laughs> um, and I, 
I, I think there's a bigger question. I mean, definitely, I think dev teams need if there is pain being caused by their solutions, some of that pain needs to make its way back to the team so that they're aware of it. Um, and and they should own, I mean, they should own kind of fixing it, but I don't think they should own it alone. I think like as a business, you also as kind of like as a business have a responsibility for ensuring you're not going to kind of mess up the world by I don't know, making a thousand people's lives rely on two overworked devs, <laughs> for example. Um, so, yeah, so maybe this touches on Lucky's point. Like the responsibility is kind of everyone's, and that extends beyond the dev team kind of in, into the business. Um, yeah. Yeah. So well, we know the, the, the thing about uh, it used to be someone builds it, someone else has to maintain it but the whole transition in recent years to you build it you run it okay you build it you run it there ain't no one else gonna run this baby for you it's your baby however i've seen in massive organizations uh what happens is as simon said there's a few devs they've done this but now they're working all day coding then they're supporting at night they have no lives and I'm sorry, even as a highly skilled expert, we deserve lives, okay? We deserve to have a glass of wine, have a braai, go for a jog, spend time with our children and friends. And I find very often that behavior becomes abusive because you're like, oh, no, we know that lucky, you, he's so smart, I'm just going to go, straight. I'm not going to go to first line support because you're they don't know they don't i'm just gonna call lucky 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 please whatsapp and lucky's there because lucky cares because he's he takes pride right this gets mm. abused and so therefore when the devs i feel have built it we need to then upskill as part of our larger team now, i'm not talking about the tiny you know the larger team we will generally have in large organizations a first line support then there'll be like a second support and then you call the dev at 11 at night because he's probably awake sorting out a database problem anyway <laughs> um it's true we all know this right but i honestly think that very often uh, uh devs are abused to support uh because other people have not applied themselves in getting to know this um and uh, uh obviously no detail but it has happened before where instructions was written down training was given to another support team but they, the the knowledge didn't seem to transfer and so it remained lucky's problem and yeah. you know lucky also has people I mean, it's not it's like humans, but also though, like so, you also really cared. So I like what you're saying, Karina. And that's a good point. That's a nice counter argument, eh? and you, Simon, as well. Like I like that perspective. What I've struggled to find, and I think as an industry, now we're talking about so we've done this terribly, is we've never properly defined the scope of our professional engagement. In other words, how the world perceives our environment. We've kind of like just gone along with this process and we don't even have a body governing our ways of work and what the standards are, quality. Like this is a general problem. But you know, when we build a system and a million people are affected and it's down, and we're saying no, leave it to the devs because they have lives. I, I raise the question like we don't go to a hospital and say oh wait you know the surgeons must have lives therefore people are dying but they must wait till tomorrow because they must go home and have a glass of wine but as a world and society we have defined what their social responsibility is for that professional service we've not actually done this and the problem is our scope of work varies geez from building apps to uh, medical systems to payment systems to whatever the the impact of a system going down is significantly different right the one is fine the other one's like you know people's lives are at risk and, and it requires action i think the more important thing maybe to talk to your support line Rina, is like you, you know earlier we spoke about requirement analysis and getting the project started having a plan for your system once it go live so your development team isn't the sole be end and whatever because if it is that lucky is the only guy because he cares 
if Lucky, you know, is unfortunate enough to break his leg in a soccer match because he's too intense uh, and takes it too seriously, then he's in hospital or unable to assist and the business is anyway down. We've created a key man responsibility, which sounds terrible. So it sounds like there's no, you know, that sounds like we've never thought this through. It's like when there's go, li go live, I mean, most of, I guess we lucky we serve enterprise customers. So we're in this habit of defining a first line support as a, um, a second line of support would be the development team and also upfront building tools that manually allows a non-technical person to restart the server, restart the app to whatever, whatever basic thing it is just to get the thing doing. We, we do that upfront. But if this is not happening and it's happening significantly, then we kind of like have to define these as rules. Now, the interesting thing is, and Simon, this is probably where you better, you know, um, as a more technical focused person, but a lot of the big enterprise uh, people that build or proponents of new technologies, let's say Microsoft, right, with the .NET. So I've got a .NET background, so I'm going to speak to that. They've defined that whole project lifestyle thing, right, that little eight on its side that talks through the initial requirement calculus all the way through support. And it sounds to me like we're trying to address a gap in that eight. We don't have a perfect, you know, infinite sign mm -hmm. running. And that's where we're falling flat. Or these teams are falling flat. I mean, if if we talk about earlier about like, you know, what we can and can't control is if the development team has, to Karina's point, put in documentation, built in a way for them to restart the app, to have done these things and are still called at night. I agree. Like you need to start backing your developers. But as engineers, I'm hoping that we have the foresight to think that once my system is live, it is affecting people's lives and I have a responsibility to ensure that stuff can continue even when I'm not around. So I don't need to spend my Saturday and Sunday and 12 o'clock at night working on stuff. Yeah, and I think this planning for failure is really important. And I think a lot of companies like Tina's, is, I'm not sure if this was actually on the call, I was chatting before, um, a lot of companies, when they plan for failure, really plan about how to get the customer using their service again. Um, so kind of Vodacom goes down and their plan is to kind of get you connected to Vodacom again. But that's not really a, a plan for failure for the customer. Um, and yeah, and I think it's, it's, it would be good to push kind of systems to plan more for failure for the customer. Um, oh, sorry, Lucky, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I think uh, it's very important to differentiate between outlying scenarios where we've deployed something, something we've missed something in the process and now something has gone down. It's very important to differentiate between that and a space where the leadership team or the management of the project and the client have failed to plan capacity and tooling around our team. So if your developers working 16 hour days every single day for two weeks straight that's already a problem it's a problem with the capacity it's a problem with the environment that you're building so we must be able to understand that these two things need to be treated very very differently so if i'm being called every single night because things go down because we're building super fast and we don't have the right things in place no matter how much i care about what i'm putting up there i will get tired and i will act actually just decide I'm done with this and I will get burnt out. So it's important to differentiate between those two and the solutions are different. Yeah, yeah you will suddenly appear on offer zen on offer. <laughs> <laughs> and someone will say, yo, senior, we can leave. <laughs> See that little banner on his LinkedIn profile. You're like, oh. <laughs> I think, uh, Candice, you have your hand up? Yeah, so I mean, lots of opinions going around here. So if I could just add one thing, if there is a, a first line and a second line of support supporting the team and that the team does have an eight hour day and they're quite doing well on their, their deliveries, um, I think it's important just to check back on the, the support lines every now and again, because um, if they have to restart your program every Sunday morning, you know, is there a memory issue there? Is there a connection pool issue that you actually need to solve as a developer that was working on the program? Um, I've noticed in the past where like second line support will do quick data fixes. Um, and this happened like often, right? Like 50 a week type thing, but it's the same data fix that's happening 50 times a week. 
And eventually we realized that it was because of an application flow problem, not because of users being silly or because there was an actual problem. So I think that feedback loop with the support team is also really important just to make sure that your app is okay, it's in a good position. And if they are constantly trying to solve the same problems over and over again, then maybe it's something that needs to be fixed internally as part of the dev team. Yeah. And that is something that should be documented. Take it from the BA. They should <laughs> along somewhere. Like, this was the error. This was the time. This is how we solved it in the short term. Should it be investigated for root cause analysis? There you go. Yeah, that's I think a, uh, a first line of defense person who really cares, probably really cares about not bothering the second line because they can do it, you know. Yeah. So I think there is something yeah. something that needs to be dug into there. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good point. Um, so it is now 7.30 and we've been talking for 90 minutes, which is it's a long time, actually. Um, <laughs> so I think let's let's wrap up. Is there any any final closing thoughts? Anything that any of you want to add before we wrap up? No, I've enjoyed hearing the different perspective of the team. I love it. It's been okay, fun going. Well, well. Thank you, Sheena, Simon, Lucky. Thanks, guys, for your insights as well. And Sheena, thanks for setting this up. It's really cool. Awesome. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, everyone. It's, and I, I hope some of our listeners are inspired to kind of think about how to improve. Um, mm. Yeah, I'll drop some comments below. <laughs> Isn't that the thing, YouTubers, YouTubers do that, right? People, yeah, they say smash that like button. That's Comment the and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Last thoughts, um, which I which I always try to, 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 to say to clients when we're in crisis mode is that Never forget that while you have a team, just remember that everyone is still a person. We're working with humans and treat them as such. Sometimes people's tempers will rise and they'll come yeah. back. So just remember that you're working with people and people will always be people, no matter how skilled they get. Yeah, and also make sure the systems you build treat humans as humans. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks everyone. It was, thanks, Gina. It was real. <laughs> thanks everyone. That was fun. Hope to see you again. Bye. Bye bye. Just, uh...